Even though I was a hospice nurse and an expert at managing other people's pain, like most of us, I knew nothing about cannabinoid therapy. And I figured if a major surgery couldn't help me, if morphine couldn't relieve my pain, then a joint wasn't gonna do anything. But more than my lack of knowledge, I was petrified of the stigma. You know, I didn't want to be a mom on pot. You know, the same day I started medical marijuana, I was able to stop both opiates and Valium and later titrate off of everything else. I am not a nurse. I like to joke that I play one on TV when people ask me if I'm a nurse. So I'm here to talk to you about how to talk to your children about cannabis. I think we all long for a deeper connection with our children. The stigma of this plant has caused so many people so much pain and suffering. It was like this little girl was just waiting to be brought into the world. And we had it all and we were thriving until one day when our daughter was eight and a half months old, her left eye began to shake. We had been assured that the chance of there being anything wrong with her was like finding a needle in a haystack. Unfortunately, her pediatrician called that weekend, and our child was that needle in a haystack. She had been diagnosed with a low-grade optic pathway glioma brain tumor. We intend on taking this the distance. This medicine is going to help change the way we treat patients today and in the future. When I first explored becoming a cannabis patient, I was really scared. You know, first, I really didn't think it was going to help. Even though I was a hospice nurse and an expert at managing other people's pain, like most of us, I knew nothing about cannabinoid therapy. So when I was injured at work, I pursued traditional healthcare, and I figured if a major surgery couldn't help me, if morphine couldn't relieve my pain, then a joint wasn't going to do anything. But more than my lack of knowledge, I was petrified of the stigma. You know, I didn't want to be a mom on pot. And it was only thanks to my own mother's loving guidance that I explored cannabis further and that I discovered the vast body of evidence that actually supports cannabis as a medication. And so my parents took me to the dispensary and bought me pot. It was a very weird experience. But when I tried it, I was blown away. You know, the same day I started medical marijuana, I was able to stop both opiates and Valium and later titrate off of everything else. Thank you. You know, it was, it was remarkable for my health, but what surprised me the most is cannabis actually made me a better parent. You know, first, I was able to eliminate bottles of deadly pharmaceuticals that were in my home. I was able to get rid of the devastating side effects like fatigue and depression and constipation. Um, but more than that, cannabis actually relieved my pain way better than any pharmaceutical ever did. And because of that, it allowed me to engage more with my kids. And it allowed me to engage more with life. And it's amazing when I think back how I almost didn't try it because of the stigma. The stigma against cannabis is a really serious, dangerous thing. It's killing people. I mean, besides the fact that cannabis could help with conditions like cancer or epilepsy, Pharmaceuticals are still the frontline treatment, and many of them are potentially deadly. There was a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that showed between the years 1999 and 2016, there were almost 9,000 children who died from prescription overdoses and opiates. 
And that number had increased by 286% in 20 years. You know, besides prescription pharmaceuticals being a serious issue for our youth and even for adults, recreational opiate use is rampant, both among youth and among adults. You know, why? Like, what is it that we're teaching our children, and what are we not teaching them that is encouraging them to choose opiates? And one of the challenges is, we don't talk about cannabis because of the stigma. Patients are hiding their medication from other people. Patients are hiding it from their children. And children primarily learn about cannabis and opiates and other drugs strictly from school where we have outdated health classes, and we have programs like DARE. In 1992, Indiana University published a study, published a study that showed that graduates of DARE had higher rates of illegal drug use than non-graduates. And a 10-year investigation by the American Psychological Association confirmed that. And DARE has been revamped somewhat since the 1990s, but they are still teaching prohibitionist era education. They teach outright against medical marijuana. They say that Marinol should be used instead. But the more dangerous issue is they are teaching that cannabis and opiates are equally dangerous. And the problem is, children don't have fully developed prefrontal cortexes. They cannot comprehend consequence, and they make very loose associations. So they are seeing CEOs on TV smoking pot with no issue. They hear things like Joe Montana just got into the industry. They are seeing medical marijuana patients everywhere benefit from this plant. So they take the information they get at school and they're like, well, they told me weed was dangerous and I see that it's really not that bad. Maybe, maybe these pills aren't that bad either. Maybe the stories about heroin are also overinflated. And that is a dangerous, dangerous idea. So why don't we talk to our kids? Again, it's the stigma. Parents are afraid. And they're afraid of what their kids are going to go and say at school as well. You know, but the stigma can be addressed, and it needs to be addressed. And thanks to neuroplasticity, we do have the ability to create new, more powerful associations to this plant. And it's people like us. It's individuals who are educated and responsible and know about the benefits of the plant who go out and share their stories and share the knowledge that they learn. And that is how we attack the stigma. So after today and tomorrow, when you leave here, I implore you to please share your story. I mean, you don't, you don't have to get a billboard. I did. You don't have to. You don't have to be on TV. But talk to your friends. Talk to your children. Talk to your family members. And really consider talking to your coworkers. Because it's people like us who are changing the conversation around this plant and are really molding the future. I'm Jessie. I am a registered nurse. I am a mom and I am proud to be a cannabis patient. Thank you for listening. Good morning, everyone. I hope you guys are having a beautiful day. I was welcomed into this community um, in 2014. I was lucky enough to attend the, one of the first Cannabis Nurses Network conferences. 
I am not a nurse. I like to joke that I play one on TV when people ask me if I'm a nurse. But these women have so much knowledge, and knowledge is power. And in this day and age, we have the ability to not just connect with each other through medical or through, um, through people's, uh, I guess, idea of what cannabis use is. So I'm here to talk to you about how to talk to your children about cannabis. I think we all long for a deeper connection with our children. Uh, my favorite time was being in the car with my kids and um, you know, I'd give them these lovely lectures, and as I'd impart my wisdom, they'd look out the window. And um, you kind of really wonder what's sinking in. Um, we have such a great ability with technology today to connect with each other, but it's also brought us great disconnect. So when we look at our kids and we wonder, who are they getting their knowledge from? And since children learn in the home, the first things, they, uh, they definitely have, um, they watch you by experience. I have taught my kids all the time by example. I think it's important for us to, they'll mimic, they'll imitate, um, but once they have social media in their hands, you think that you're protecting your children. You think that you have the ability to um, control their actions. And when um, my son was in in junior high and high school, he liked to play this video game. And I mean, not being very technical, I would take the router out of the wall at night and I would hide it thinking that he couldn't have, you know, play his games on the internet. Uh, he would just get it from the neighbors. My daughter, who I said no phones at the table, she would it has the ability to text under the table without even looking at me <laughs> while, she, while she's looking at me having a conversation. So it's important that they don't get their information from social media, from the influencers, because this information is incorrect. The, the women on this stage have an additional challenge in motherhood and parenting, and that additional challenge is um, having Child Protective Services come in and take their children, if their children go to school and they say, you know, I use cannabis or my mother uses cannabis or my father has these plants. And that is something that needs to change in a big way. The stigma of this plant has caused so many people so much pain and suffering. Um, so in my wonderful wisdom that I imparted, I also imparted, I, I was a Girl Scout leader and a Cub Scout leader, and one time I was driving and I'm hearing, I'm listening to the small things, because when you listen to the small things, you can hear the bigger things later, and I'm hearing them sing the song about um, crack. And so I thought it would be a great opportunity to say, you know, which is what I told my children always, if you're going to do any, you know, anything substance-wise, it should be, you know, I call it weed because that's my generation, but, you know, weed or shrooms because they're natural and they grow in the ground. So yes, the next morning I had to call every single parent <laughs> and explain what I said in the car. Um, so again, as far as parenting, not being a perfect parent and not being someone who has the wisdom or the knowledge, we all have the ability to plant seeds in our children. We all, they might not be ready to hear our message, but they are listening. Um, I, I think that if, if we are making mistakes, we'd rather them make them at home than in the, uh, in the outside world. So if I could say anything, I would say um, we can teach our children not to touch a hot stove, not to talk to strangers, not to cross the street, but we can also teach them to not take other people's medications. Um, studies show that most of the college students and even high school students out there are studying on Ritalin or Adderall. We are a pill society. People have a very easy, you know, if you have a headache, you take a pill. If you have a cold, you take a pill. So we've gotten used to that pharmaceutical um, delivery system. So you can teach your children 
if you're bringing a substance into your house, whether it's cannabis, whether it's alcohol, a loaded firearm, anything, you're gonna protect your children, but you also need to teach your children to be respectful and to honor their bodies. And I always say what you put in you, on you, and around you, anything you put in your mouth, drinks, food, um, body parts, anything, you need to make sure that you are cognizant that this is your choice and that you have to be responsible for what's going to happen to you. Um, I should have listened to my intuition the other night. I've been eating seafood for three days, and I kept saying, maybe this isn't such a good idea. But of course, it's so delicious. And that intuition, I didn't listen. And um, so we can teach our kids from our actions, not just our words, um, that this is important, that, that honoring your intuition, knowing that if your friend is possibly trying, you know, acid or heroin or the Tide Pod Challenge or any of these other things that are on social media, that you don't have to do that. But they're teenagers sometimes and they're going to make bad choices. But we hope that they'll make better choices and cannabis is a choice that's not ever going to kill them. And so while I don't advocate for uh, teenagers consuming cannabis, I do advocate for talking to your children honestly and openly about everything because that's how they'll trust you and that's how they'll work out their way out into the world. So I'm Chris Morwood, thank you so much. And I do, have, um, I do write children's books and I'd love to talk to any of you about your stories. have the perfect life. I had found the man of my dreams and married him after five years. We had a booming business together where we, we were doing websites and social media management and graphic design for huge companies like IBM, Samsung, Paramount Studios. I had achieved everything Please I had dreamt of. Talk. And the only thing missing was a child. I'd always wanted to be a mommy since I was a little girl. And I'd always wanted a little girl because the ballerina was just way too much to even contemplate in my mind having a cute little girl running around in a pink tutu. So my husband and I decided to get pregnant right away. And we did, immediately. It was like this little girl was just waiting to be brought into the world. And we had it all in our minds. We weren't rich by any means, but we were comfortable. We were happy. And we were thriving until one day, when our daughter was eight and a half months old, her left eye began to shake. So we took her to the pediatrician on Monday, ophthalmologist on Tuesday, Wednesday was neurologist, and by Friday, she was in an MRI, getting a brain scan. Now we had been assured that the chance of there being anything wrong with her was like finding a needle in a haystack. Unfortunately, her pediatrician called that weekend, and our child was that needle in a haystack. She had been diagnosed with a low-grade optic pathway glioma brain tumor. And although this brain tumor had a 90% survival rate, it had an 85% recurrence rate. Leaving these children oftentimes on chemotherapy for years. And this was the only option because only 3.8% of all government funding goes to pediatric cancer research. Meaning my child was going to be enduring years of drugs that were antiquated, they didn't work. And this tumor has an 85% recurrence rate because they hadn't found anything to stop it. Luckily, we were connected to Ricky Lake of Film and Television and Abby Epstein weeks within our daughter's diagnosis because at this point, we wanted to try and do anything we could to make our daughter's journey an easier one. Ricky and Abby informed us about medical cannabis and using it for pediatric cancer a thought we had completely dismissed when originally brought to us through mutual friends overseas, who we ourselves thought were high on something way more than cannabis. <laughs> but we listened to them and we read the research and we talked to her oncologist and we all agreed this looked like an option for our daughter. So at nine months old, my daughter Sophie took her first dose of cannabis on film, which you can now watch on any of the download devices on iTunes, on Amazon, and on Netflix in April. Our journey 
began at that point, and it was one that I cannot describe. I, it's not one I could have predicted. It is one filled with miracle after miracle after miracle for this beautiful little girl. Now, one of the things that you'll notice in these pictures of Sophie is that she looks like a normal kid, except for the one, of course, where she's got the mask on after the MRI. And that is how she has been, for the most part, using cannabinoid therapy. We have watched her heal in ways we could never even imagine. Her doctors can't explain what they're seeing. Her bone marrow repairing itself after nine blood transfusions, which is medically impossible. Healing from brain tumor surgeries in ways that medical science can't explain. No bruising, no signs of visible swelling. Released from the hospital in less than 48 hours and told she could go back to school in one to two days, which is the bottom picture on the right at hour 38 post brain surgery. We knew after seeing these things in our daughter that there was so much more to this plant. And after seeing patient after patient after patient heal, we knew that there was so much more to this plant. Watching kids with autism speak for the first time, watching their self-injured behavior and rage completely go away permanently, only to learn that science is now telling us that these kids all have an anandamide deficiency. What is THC when you consume it? An anandamide. So the science is evolving and we're watching it right before our eyes. And it was at this point that we said, all right, we have to do more. We know it works. We see it works. Why does it work? What is our next step? And we knew we had to get involved in the science. We knew we had to be a part of the research. I took Sophie's brain tumor tissue halfway across the world to Israel, to the Technion Institute, about three and a half years ago, to Professor Dedi Miri, who many of you may have heard of in the room. He's one of the foremost leading cancer research scientists in the world using cannabinoid therapy. And it was on this trip Dedi saw my passion for healing. I didn't ask him, what can you do for me? I asked him, what can I do for you? And he said, Trace, all I need is money. So I went and got him some. Never raised a dollar in my life, but I was bound and determined to get research for my child because no one else was going to do it. And so three years later, we have 47 scientists studying all different types of cancers in both pediatrics and adults. Thank you. And we are discovering things that will blow the top of your head off that I can't wait to publish and share. But what's even more exciting for me is now, because of that brain tumor surgery on April 23rd of 2018, my daughter's brain tumor tissue is growing in mice that pump human blood, whose immune systems mirror that of human beings, making the jump from rodent to human in a trial, not an 85% failure rate, but a mirror image. Once we started looking at Sophie's immune system here, in, in, actually in Southern California and Los Angeles, where I live, at one of the top universities studying cancer, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. The doctor that we're working with is the world's leading research scientist in the field of natural killer cells with a focus on its responsibility in both making cancer happen in the first place and by fixing this defect, eradicating that such disease. Because of what Sophie's body has shown us, we now have nine more patients enrolled, which we are seeing the mirrored effect in. It is doing the same thing to their immune systems that it's doing to my child. And some of these patients had no chance of survival and are alive four years later when they were given 90 days to live. Thank you. We intend on taking this the distance. This medicine is going to help change the way we treat patients today and in the future. Our children's children aren't gonna have to fight the same fights that we have fought because of people like you and like the women on this stage. We know better and we're going to do better. Thank you. We'd love to throw a couple questions out for you to consider with your table mates. Here are the discussion questions. We've actually got two for you. So when we're going to start talking about this plant called cannabis with kids, what age is appropriate? What terminology do we use? What do we share 
as we talk about cannabis? That's question one. <laughs> the next question, really throwing down the challenge again, as a community, as the professionals that you are, how do we make sure nurses and doctors have access to this education regarding cannabis science? I know my mother is currently healing lung cancer, and I was very hopeful that she would allow cannabis to be a part of her journey. And her cancer specialist doctor said, cannabis will do nothing for you. And how do we make sure, we know that truth actually changes and science adds more detail and then we've got new information. And so your two questions are, how do we talk with young people about the plant? Is there an age to start? And how do we move this information forward to make sure our professionals have the most up-to-date information? Who thought these conversations with our young people should start at two years or less? Six years or less? Who feels like the first time we should talk about cannabis with young people is on their 21st birthday? <laughs> Let the record reflect no one raised their hands. Okay. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with each other about how do we talk with young people and what age is appropriate, maybe even how we up that conversation as the birthdays continue. And then how do we ensure our scientific and medical professional community have really good information? We've got time for your questions. Feel free to line up at the mics to share your super succinct questions. Who's first? Great. Um, I have a question about uh, being able, as a pediatric emergency room nurse, I am always dealing with a lot of chronic kids that have issues that could really benefit from cannabis. How do you talk to physicians, their specialists, their parents about maybe things that might be helpful while still staying you know, I mean, you're still working in an ER, you can't really go too far out of your hospital's idea of what's appropriate, but how do you get that information to them without jeopardizing your own career? Yeah, first of all, thank you for doing the work that you do as a pediatric trauma specialist in ER. Um, so the question's about how to bridge this subject when it may go against, maybe you're not in a medicinal state, or even if you are, if it's against the vision of your hospital to discuss such things. So, you know, it's always best to address the, the topic before you're dealing with a patient. So if your healthcare professionals in your, provide, in, in your facility are open to you know, education or even just doing like a little brief presentation on cannabinoid therapy and the benefits, that's a great way to introduce that to them. Also, nurses, reach out to your alma maters, reach out to your nursing schools and see if they'll let you in to talk to nursing students. Um, but, you know, one of the best ways to impact both healthcare professionals and, and parents who are not open is with personal stories. You know, if you point out listen, let me show you a case study. This is what happened. This is what they did. You know, it's something to be aware of that gives them, you know, an opening to go and research more about it. For me, it's been uh, a different experience as a parent, and it has been one that has been really quite incredible because when Sophie was first diagnosed, it was over five years ago, and we call ourselves pre-Sanjay Gupta. Nobody was talking about using cannabis in kids. So to have this conversation so long ago, we really had to ensure that we were properly armed with existing research that I printed out, created a folder, and took in. We want these conversations to happen, and every single person that comes into our room, we are open and honest with. And what's great about um, having Sophie is because she is such a miraculous healer. She bounces back from surgeries. She was diagnosed twice this past year with pneumonia only to be given a round of antibiotics, and the very next morning she was having a dance party in the room of her 
hospital and they were not understanding what they were seeing and didn't couldn't put down a misdiagnosis because they saw the pneumonia in the x-rays but nonetheless let us go noon by noon both days with no antibiotics so we have this little miracle child that we're able to use as our example giving her cannabis uh, when she's in severe pain and watching it the second that it hits and going and getting that nurse and saying I want you to meet my real daughter not the one who's been you know, yelling at you all morning because she doesn't want you to touch her and she's in excruciating pain. This is what it looks like when we give her cannabis. Using our pain topical when she's like having you know, these horrible gut issues that relieves the pain within 60 seconds when opioids aren't really doing what they should do. Using that as an example to say, this is what cannabis is doing for our child. And having those educated conversations from a scientific basis as well, any chance we can get someone to listen. So it's literally about being able to have, for us, confident conversations where we walk in and we know what we're talking about. We have science to spill. We've got you know, the anandamide and autism data. We've got the mouse models and gliomas that's being done in Israel, and we can cite these different publications. So it's really about being armed with knowledge and, and being able to share it in a way that medical professionals can understand and wrap their heads around. Um, yeah, this was for... Uh for really for Tracy, with any of the facilities that you've gone to, have you seen any policies that address self-administration of cannabis or caregiver administration of cannabis? So at least there's like a model we can look at. Yeah, has there been policy changes based on what Tracy's experienced with medical professionals in hospitals and, and is there some shareable information with that? So not inside hospitals. Um, it's. Right now, with the hospitals in California, the way that it works with us is we are able to give the nurses the medicine which they can chart and log, which they do for Sophie, and then they can store it and label it, and then they can bring it back to us to administer it, but they themselves can't administer it yet. We have, um, we have laws that we're working on passing in California so that par parents can actually come onto school grounds and not have to remove their child from school grounds and administer it on campus. Um, we, that, bill, that bill failed last year, but there was just one little piece of language that needed to be tweaked, so we're rerunning it through again this year, which we think it'll pass. So this is what we have to do. We have to do the science, and that will then allow the medical professionals to then administer the medicine without having to, to worry about the federal uh, Ill illegalization that we're going through right now. And I'm not sure if with Canada being having ended federal prohibition, if we're going to see a system develop up there that we might be able to model when things change governmentally here. Who's got the next question? Yeah. Tracy, my name is Tammy, and I'm from Tennessee. Are you the lady from Tennessee? That's me. <laughs> we need to talk. Tennessee Tracy right here. From a little town with one red light in yeah. Linden, Tennessee. Uh, yep. You know, that could be Mitchellville. You know where Mitchellville is, right? Know who? Oh, Mitchellville, Tennessee. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, yes, okay, cool, yeah. <laughs> they still just have one like. But anyway, um, one of my questions is, is now I'm, I'm a patient, I'm a nurse, and my children, I have one that will smoke and participate, but it's only to get high, um, and I try to educate him on everything, but and I, t I talk to my grandchildren quite a bit. I have 12, 12 year old, and 11, and one just turned 11, and the next one's nine. So I educate them on something every time I'm with them because I really don't want them learning at school. Mm -hmm. So, because I know what I learned at school, everything that I'm trying to unlearn. But um, what do I do? Uh, how do I approach my son into? letting me address or getting permission because he will say, you have no right, those are my children. Even though he loves me, he thinks I'm crazy because I go and I do all these, this research and everything. You guys have hit every aspect of my life here. And he thinks I'm crazy. The other son knows. He's, he's I'll just say I didn't raise that son. So there's that barrier in between there. So is the question about, as a grandmother, how to really interact even though your sons or your children without, are preferring the conversation doesn't without happen? Without him saying, you can never see my kids again. Okay. 
You know, this is not a shameless plug. I do believe the movie Weed the People is an incredible tool to show anyone for the simple fact that it falls five families, ours being one of them. And you get to watch these children, some of them from diagnosis like my daughter, all the way through to healing their journey over five years um, in our case. And there's no denying what you're seeing in these kids getting well. The other thing in the film that's so incredible is it also shows the research that's going on all around the world with Professor Daddy Mary, Christina Sanchez, Manuel Guzman. So you get to see the research live. And it also covers the stigma of cannabis and why it was made to be illegal in the first place because of Harry Anslinger and William Randolph Hearst. So you get the history as well. So it's a very well-rounded tale of how we got here and now what we need to do to fix it because it is clearly, clearly a beneficial medicine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The movie is called Weed the People. Who has the next question? So as you think about your next question, I've got a question for the panel, which is, you know, you talked about sharing misinformation and truth, and I find that what we found to be true 10 years ago, we now have new information on, so there's a new truth. So was that wrong when information changes, when we get new patents, when we get new information, when we have more and more case studies? So how do we manage the ever-changing landscape of what's true now? You're welcome. <laughs> that is an interesting question. Um, you know, it's, I tell my kids and I tell people all the time, we just didn't know. Like the information was held, you know, withheld from us. And we are only just starting to research this plant. So of course it's going to change. Of course we're going to learn new information about it and we're probably going to learn uh, that some of the things we believe right now aren't 100% accurate, and that's got to be expected. But I think introducing people to the complex history, and like Tracy mentioned, you know, the history making the plant illegal is a great way to start of why we have so much inaccurate information. And I'd like to add something, too, is that coming to conferences like this, you're going to learn so much from a level that's way up here. And there are cannabis and hemp and CBD conferences all over the country. We have the options now in legal and states that are trying to legalize. So some of the conferences are appropriate, some are not, but there's so much information out there that wasn't available even five years ago. And as these studies change and as these things come online, it will destigmatize this plan. It will normalize the conversation. We just have to change the vernacular. So it's the same as talking about any other pharmacology or anything, any other therapeutic treatment. It has to be added and included into the conversation. For me, it's always about going to the science, pulling the recent studies, knowing the recent studies, knowing how to communicate those recent studies. So it's just about, for us, keeping up to date with the ever-evolving research and following people like Ethan Russo, Sue Sicily, Dr. Deddy Miri, Christina Sanchez, Manuel Guzman, and watching their ever-evolving science as it's published and knowing what that is so that we can communicate it appropriately. I know everybody was really trying. Say those names again. You're Sorry. welcome. Yeah. Ethan for Russo. all you court reporters, I know you got it. <laughs> oh wait, none of you are here. So what Ethan, are those names? Ethan Russo. Dr. Sue Sisley, S-I-S-L-E-Y. Manuel Guzman, out of, out of Spain, as well as Christina Sanchez. Another great one out of Canada is Catherine McCollum. She has um, studied under Ethan Russo and they have published papers together. Great, thank you. And our final question, Elizabeth. Hello, Louise Esmond. Okay. Congratulations on the film. I've seen it a couple of times. We, Thank the you. People, you all need to watch it. Um, we were having a discussion about the pediatric dosing. And so one of the things, you know, most of us are working with older adults, five milligrams twice a day. Can you just give us some perspective on dosing of these cannabinoids with kids? Because I kind of know Sophie's uh, dosing, and it was blowing their mind that we're talking several hundred milligrams yeah. of THC, CBD, CBG. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some perspective on what you're using? Sure, absolutely. So with SOF, we have tried a varying degree of different types of protocols because we believe that 
if a tumor can build a tolerance to chemotherapy, it can also potentially build a tolerance to the cannabinoids that that child is taking at the time in that combination. So we're ever evolving. Sophie is on high doses. She's on about 325 milligrams of CBD, um, just under 200 milligrams of THC. She takes 100 milligrams a day of THCA and about 50 to 60 milligrams of CBDA. We've also tried CBG. It seemed to make her a little irritated, which it can do in some children, but those are usually in typically much lower doses, the, as the acids and the secondary and tertiary cannabinoids. We don't get Sophie high. She, your body builds a tolerance to this medicine. We're gonna do final thoughts, Jesse. So um, we are all mostly healthcare providers here, nurses, nurses is Nursing is the most trusted profession out of all the professions consistently. Um, just keep in mind as you go back to your lives, we have an ethical obligation to get our patients the right medication, and we have an obligation to be advocates. So I know speaking up is so scary sometimes, but I think we really need to dig down deeply and... Um, find the strength to be able to talk about these options to our patients. Thank you. Chris? My final thought is that we need to educate all generations, not just the younger generations. I think that the older generations, our parents and grandparents, and the crotchety neighbor who doesn't understand what you have in your greenhouse, I think that we all, <laughs> we all have the option of showing by example. It's, it's just like anything else. You know, you can use a, a tincture or you can put a chapstick on that contains CBD or THC. You can use topicals. So instead of reaching for a pill bottle, instead of reaching for something that is socially acceptable, um, we can give ourselves the option of using something that is a healthier choice. And if we educate all generations um, we will be in a much better spot. As medical professionals, I want to empower each and every one of you to really dig into this medicine. One of the things we need most today is data. And I implore you to find a way to meticulously track that data in a sophisticated methodology so that you can start looking for patterns and that you can start understanding what a baseline dosing protocol should be for leukemia with the understanding that this kid may be on this medicine, this child may be on this one, this adult may be taking this one, and understanding that you need to navigate around that, but having a clear and concise starting point based on your anecdotal findings. Those anecdotal findings can help us reverse engineer medical science because with cannabis, we are first in human. We aren't first in human with other drugs. And being able to come together as a community and use this anecdotal research is going to drive our in-clinical research faster, getting us to human trials more expeditiously, getting patients' medicine that has been trialed and tested is accurate, dose after dose, bottle after bottle, and it will help us move the needle on a plant that deserves to be destigmatized once and for all. Some appreciation for our panelists.